favorite TV shows used to be Alias. I don't know if any of you remember that. That was like a, it's like a spot, yeah. Yeah, it probably is a long time ago. I, I think it was like, you know, in my mind it was like it finished like a year ago, but it's probably like 15 years ago or something. I don't think it's quite that much, maybe, maybe five, six years ago. Yeah, but at any rate, what I liked about that, you know, that show followed a certain format, and I don't think it's unique to Alias, but I, I, I think I think a lot of shows follow this format. Of the plots in that were incredibly complicated. So what they would do typically is the first five minutes or so of the show would sort of refresh your memory in case, yeah, recap in case you missed last week, or in case you couldn't remember last week, or in case. The, the plot was just so complicated that you were confused about last week. All right? So that would be the first five minutes. Then there would be some new stuff. And then it always set it up so that there was a cliffhanger all right, at the very end to make you come back. And I guess movies do that too now. You know, the movie, a good movie, or not a good movie, but, but a profitable movie will often set itself up for the sequel all right, uh, at, at the very end. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but in this case, uh, our cliffhanger from last time was why was our code bad? Oh, yeah. So let's start out. That's the cliffhanger. Let, let's first do our recap where it shows, you know, how I got into the mess of being tied to the railroad tracks with an oncoming train. Uh, and then... And then we'll go back and and uh, try to resolve our cliffhanger of why this code isn't good. So let me pull up the example from last time. We use that as a starting point, and then we'll begin our discussion. I guess in the fact that, you know, a lot of times there's like classes, more advanced classes, in a way maybe that's the sequel to this class, you know, is, or some of the other classes. I don't know, maybe it works that way. Alright, let's bring this here up. Someone sent me 
an email, and I forget who, um, but, but to be more specific, someone in this class. I don't get random emails like this just from regular you know, people. Although I am, sometimes I do. Um, and um, they asked something uh, to the effect of their, their, their code wasn't working. They had their code behind, and they thought their code behind was correct, but it just wasn't doing anything. The reason was, if you looked at their control, there wasn't the on-click event to tie this button to their function. So whoever asked that question, if you're here today or if you're, you're watching uh, through the magic of television, um, that was, that's what the issue was. And that was my problem the other day. Again, if you remember, I, I had one of these. I just copied it, and I wasn't paying attention. And I didn't go back and set that, so it didn't know that that new function I created was associated with that button click. All right. Anyhow, looking at our code for this, we have our on-click event. So when the button is clicked, we first check to see if, if the page is valid. And again, we, we went through that um, at great length. We're, we're, this, this is sort of a, a uh, catch for if client-side validation is turned off and, and the validation is, is going on in the server side. Because uh, if it's not valid, we don't want to bother going ahead and doing the calculations. We declare some variables. We test the value of our radio button using the selected value. All right. If you'll notice, again, the, 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 a lot of these controls have very similar attributes. You know, A drop-down and a radio button really are kind of very similar to each other, right? in the sense that they both have a selected value, all right? Because they're both selecting one item among a list of options. They both have a selected value, they both have a value, and they have an index. So we can go and look to see what has been uh, checked, what has been selected. So if it's dine in, um, then we do this calculation. We look and we grab the value of the level of service. We grab the value of the bill. And then we have a simple if statement to look through these possibilities. And then finally, when we're done, we take the value of the tip and pop it into that label. Questions about this code as it is? All right. So the cliffhanger from last time, what's wrong with this code? And I'm not asking about the way the page looks. I'm not asking about the UI, because, yeah, there's a lot of things we could do to improve that. I'm not asking about my policy as a tipper, all right? Gee, you should really tip the person at Chipotle even though you're carrying out. Okay, whatever, all right? Uh, I'm asking about the code itself. What is wrong with the code? Assuming it's doing what it's supposed to do, um, what's wrong with it? It works. It gives us the results that we'd expect. So what's wrong with it? Or is nothing wrong with it, and we can call it a day and have an early start to the weekend. Did you ever think that? Like, maybe that's how a cliffhanger resolves, is, you know, the train does come, run over, runs over the star of the show, and that's it. And then they show commercials for the next 55 minutes. <laughs> We're not going to do that in this class, though. All right. What is wrong with this code? It's not formatted. What do you mean formatted? Well, like the display, well, I guess the... Yeah. I'm not talking about the way the, way the output looks. Okay. I'm talking about strictly this chunk of code. Yes. It's kind of cluttered with the repeating. You can put it into like components to make it easier to read and find stuff. Okay, I like the thought about components. Not necessarily because it's cluttered. I mean, I don't think this this code is terribly cluttered. Yes? There's no comments. There's no <laughs> comments, okay. Um, okay, the statement was that it should be in the class. Uh, it should be in a class as opposed to here. And that's a great conclusion. Let's, let's, get to, let's get to the reasons why you make that conclusion. All right? So that conclusion is right. Ultimately, that's the, that, that's the final answer. That's the, that's the ending answer. But let's work through the process of how we get to it. Why is that a better solution? Or in other words, what's wrong with this solution? Yes? You're combining combining logic about the user interface with the logic of okay. what you're calculating. That, that's true. I'm combining what we'll call business logic, 
you know, our problem domain logic. Our problem here is restaurants and calculating tips, and there's our logic. We're combining that with the user interface logic, and that's bad. Why is that bad? I can do this, I can do this all day, <laughs> you know. And again, I'm not doing it just to uh, be difficult. I want to make sure you really understand, like, why this is a better way of doing it. Yes? Because if someone were all they'd have to do is get into that one file and mess with it, and they could ruin the whole program. Okay, that's sort of a side effect of this. All right. Um, anyone care to continue of why all these things are true? Yes? Well, you could reuse the business logic if yeah. it was separate. That's the big word is reuse. This code has zero reusability. Zero. This code, the way it's written now, can only be used on this page, on this button. All right? So again, this is tip calculation, but we could substitute any sort of calculation. You know, the, the, the charging of sales tax on something, the, the, the calculation of a, of a delivery fee or shipping fee, or, or any sort of process, payroll process, calculating withholding tax or whatever. The problem is, is that this code can't be shared with anyone else. This code lives on the button. So quite literally, if I were to put a second button on this page, you know, I've seen forms that have had two buttons, you know, one at the top, one at the bottom. If it's a real long form, sometimes it's nice to do that, you know. Uh, if I literally took that approach and had a button on the top and a button on the bottom to do the calculate, then it isn't going to work. All right, because that code lives as part, it, 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 it is part of the code associated with that button. Um, the word for this is it's tightly coupled. We have our user interface and business logic tightly coupled. Another way to say it is that code lives on that button, which means that it could only be called when that button is pressed. And we might want to call it from other places. All right? So, that's in a nutshell what's wrong. There's no reusability, um, and there, there's no reusability, and therefore we'd have to duplicate this code if we put a second button on the page. We'd have to duplicate this code if there was a second page that needed this calculation. So, again, I think I put up on the board DRY, do not repeat yourself. All right? That would be repeating yourself, and that's bad. Why is it bad? Well, some of the reasons Ashley mentioned. You know, if you wanted to go and change the code, you know, you, you could go and you'd, you'd have to go and, and change it in multiple places, and it'd just be a nightmare to maintain. Um, if I ever ask a question again, and you're not sure of the answer, um, just yell out the word maintainability. All right? If there were tests in this class, you could write for almost any of the essay questions, maintainability. Maintainability, maintainability, maintainability. And you probably do okay. You'd probably get, you know, a 70% or so on the test. Why is that? Well, because almost everything we do software-wise is to help with the maintainability of it. All right? Almost everything that we characterize as a good practice is to make the code more maintainable. All right? Um, I had a prof and again, I apologize if I'm repeating myself. Because I, I give, you know, I talk about this obviously in almost any of my classes because, um, you know, all software development, you know, has a few very fundamental principles. And one of them is that there's a good chance your code's going to change. And uh, your challenge is not necessarily to write the most efficient code, all right, but to write the code that's most easily maintained. Sometimes people think they're all clever and do these little tricks to try to, uh, you know, cut down on, you know, hey, this will execute, you know, a microsecond faster. I had a professor who many years ago said that more mistakes have been done in the name of efficiency than for any other reason, even just blind stupidity, which, which was interesting. Why is maintainability so important? I don't think I've ever drawn this graph in this point, but there's... A graph that's been around since, like, the first program that was written, probably. And the graph represents the cost to make a change which the, uh, versus the phase of development 
that you detect the problem. All right. Typically, in, uh, in, in software development, you have an analysis phase, you have a design phase, you have a build phase, you have a testing phase, and then you have an ongoing maintenance phase. All right, so that's what that's what uh, our graph has going that way. All right, and going vertical is the cost. If we're going to cost the graph, or if we're going to graph the cost, cost the graph. If we're going to graph the cost of how much it costs to make a change in each of these phases. The graph is going to look like this. All right, it's going to have that general shape. All right, it's not linear. All right, for those of those math fans among here, um, it's not a linear progression where it goes up in a straight line where each phase is like twice the cost. This is what's called a geometric progression. Whereas not only is it increasing but it's an increasing at an increasing rate. So the only thing I remember from calculus, the, positive, the, the first derivative of this curve would be a positive number. All right? Because it's increasing at an increasing rate. All right? So that means that it is cheapest to catch an error in the analysis phase. Now, what do I mean by the analysis phase? That's where you're thinking about the requirements of what the, what the code needs to do, all right? Where you're thinking like, well, you know, I need, uh, you know, um, we need to calculate tips on this site. And, and what are tips depend on? Well, it depends on whether you're dine-in or, 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 or carry-out. And Well, it also depends on how good the service is. Now, how do we want to rate our service? On a scale of 1 to 10? Yeah. I don't know. What's the difference between a six or seven? It yeah, maybe three levels of service. It was horrible, it was okay, or it was excellent. And so on. That's the analysis where you think through and you identify the business requirements. And it also it often involves you talking with the users and, and figuring out what they need, et cetera, et cetera. We really kind of skip these phase, this phase in this class by me presenting you the problem and say, do this. The assumption is, is that I've already analyzed what needs to be done, and you can take whatever I define as what needs to be done as fact. When you get like into the systems analysis class, that's where you work through the whole process. Of You're not given a specific thing to solve. You're given a, um, a, uh, a, you know, a more general statement of a problem. That's even sort of what you need to do on a project in this class. You need to define the problem and think through. So I guess in this class for the project, we do touch on the analysis phase. The design phase is, is where you figure out how you're going to do this. All right? Well, we have a web page, and we're going to use a drop down. No, I'll use radio buttons, and so on. And you can design user interfaces, you can design the code. As was stated, in the design phase, you might identify, yeah, I'm going to use a custom class for this as opposed to having the code in my button. All right? The build's where you actually do it, testing is where you test it, maintenance is where the site is live or your application is live, and you find that you need to go back and change things. You may need to change things because you made a mistake the first time. Maybe you didn't calculate, uh, maybe you didn't take into account, uh, or you know, maybe you used 14% instead of 15% for a tip. Okay, i got to go back and change that. All right? Or maybe there's things that you just didn't foresee. All right? Um, you know, like maybe at first you didn't take into account whether it's dine-in. You failed in the analysis phase. Or maybe something about the, 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 the external conditions, the law changes. Congress passes a law that says it's illegal to tip someone more than 18%. All right? The point is that some of the things, that some of the changes that you do in the maintenance phase are your fault. In other words, you messed up. You either flat out got the code wrong, or you didn't analyze the problem properly, and you didn't define the retire, uh, requirements correctly, or, but in other cases, 
It might not have anything, you might not have done anything wrong. Just a fact of life that the world changes. All right? E, uh, uh, again, changes from external causes, like a law change. Or um, within the culture, there's a new sort of restaurant that has something between dine-in and carry-out. I don't know, express delivery or something like that. I don't know, regular delivery, you know, whatever. The point of this is, is that, as you notice, the cost of making the change, for whatever reason you need to make the change, goes up, and it goes up sharply. Therefore, you want to try to catch the problems as early as you can, because then it's going to be cheapest to fix them. And again, this shouldn't be a surprise to you. All right? If you think about building a house, you know, is it easier to make a change building the house when the house is simply a drawing on blueprints, when it's being designed? Or maybe when you're discussing with the architect. Gee, I want two bathrooms. No, wait, I want three bathrooms. Yes? They say you can use an eraser on the draft board. Or exactly. Board exactly. You can use an eraser on the draft board, but you need a uh, hammer and nails and boards to fix the, the finished product. Right? So that's a great, uh, great analogy. So again, and it's kind of intuitive. Because of this, almost anything anyone says it's a good idea to do it this way, or a good idea to do it that way, or it's better to do it this way. What they're saying is it lends to more maintainable code. So that's why I say if you're not sure, say maintainability, then at least you've answered them. So then I won't call on you for the next part of the question, which is like, how does it help the maintainability? So at any rate, in this case, the maintainability is bad because if we needed to reuse this code, it would, would have to duplicate it. Duplicate code equals bad maintainability. All right. So the problem that we have is that this code is tightly coupled to the user interface, which means that if we were to add another button on the page, if we were to have a different section of the page where, I don't know, you, you, you used a drop down to pick I don't know, a different sort of user interface would have to duplicate this code. So we're going to refactor this code. And again, what is refactoring? Refactoring is where you take code that works and make modifications to it to improve the code. And improve the code oftentimes means make it more maintainable. There's other things that you can improve about the code. You can make it more fault tolerant, for example. So if there's an error, it... Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't cause disasters and so on. But a key point here is that we're going to make it more maintainable. So we're going to do this in phases. And the reason I'm going to do this in phases is because um, to try to jump to the final answer all at once might be too big of a leap. That doesn't mean that when you do this, you have to do it in phases. All right? Um, your first part of this assignment essentially is like what I did here. Just get the thing working. All right? The second part of the assignment, so lab four, is actually make it work well and, and de develop a custom class for it. So I'm going to show you the process of refactoring that's going to have some intermediary steps. Now, you don't have to do these intermediary steps if you understand the end product. All right, you can just skip to the end product. Here's the phases that we're going to go through in doing this. Right now, we have the code is on the button click event. It's on the page. That's our baseline. We just got it working. First step we're going to do is we're going to put the code in a separate function on the page and call it from button or anywhere else on the page. 
So that's step two. All right. This will make it more maintainable because then we can put a second button on the page, like I said before, that could call the same code and we get the same results. So we can have a button on the top of the form, a button on the bottom of the form. You press either one of them, it goes and does a calculation. And each phase will talk about why it's better than the previous phase and why it's not as good as the next phase. Our third phase is we're going to change the function to accept arguments. All right. So it's still going to be on the page, but we're going to change it so, and, so that it accepts arguments and returns a value. And we'll see the flexibility that that gives us. Lastly, our final iteration here will be we're going to create, we're going to move the function to a separate class. All right. And then use that class on this page and any other page that needs this calculation. So again, this is kind of what I would expect for lab three. This is what I expect for lab four. These intermediary steps I think are effective in teaching the idea of why to do it, but you don't have to follow through those steps. If, you, if, if, you, if, if, it's, if you're able to, you can jump right to the, the finishing mark. I'll let you to decide. If you're having trouble, though, I would suggest going through these intermediary steps. Yes? On the homework, you had said um, you called it a custom class. Is yes. that what that? Yeah, that's a custom class. Right. In other words, there's not a build in to the ASP.NET framework a class to calculate tips at a restaurant. All right? Um, therefore, you have to create one of your own. Because, again, you might have different policy than your organization might have a different policy for a calculation than other ones. Forget about tips, because again, that, that's sort of a, a, a contrived situation. Shipping policy, you know. It may cause, you know, uh, for shipping and handling your order from Amazon, it might cost one thing. From Barnes & Noble, it might cost another thing, another amount. So each company has their own shipping rules of, of how much it costs per item. And if you order more than $25, you get free shipping and blah, 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 blah. All right? Each company would have their own. Therefore, there couldn't be something in the framework that said shipping cost. Right? Because each company would have their own rules for how that's calculated. So that's what I mean by a custom class. You actually make the class. You actually make the component that does this. And then that component that you make, you can plug in wherever you need to. All right? Generally speaking, .NET, the, the components in the .NET framework, again, are sort of infrastructure. Uh, uh, very fundamental things are done on any site. So it relates to databases and and the user interface and validation and all that. The business rules typically aren't defined in the framework because really that's not the place for them, right? You, you can't really define those sorts of things in the framework. All right. There are frameworks, by the way, that do have some business classes that you can extend and tweak and all that. For example, WebSphere is, a, is an e-commerce suite uh, that's done in Java. Um, you can, for example, with WebSphere, they may not know everything about the customers that you have, right? But they know that every business has customers, right? So they can create sort of a, a shell class for customers, and then you can customize it and put the stuff you want into it. Okay, so our first iteration here will be to take the code that right now lives on the button and move it to a function. That will give us the advantage of um, being able to call that code from multiple places on the page. So, again, we could put two buttons. All right? So let's go and do that. This is going to be pretty simple. Get my code behind file. I will just take this code and 